woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Hello and welcome today to the uh, bandsaw demonstration at the Spokane Woodcraft Store, your Spokane Woodcraft Store. Uh, today obviously we're going to be discussing the bandsaw and uh, we'll get into detail about uh, how to set it up properly so you can resaw with it straight, uh, how to uh, cut curves with it, which is pretty simple. Um, it just involves a couple of blade alterations. And uh, more importantly, I think for everybody is how to set it up. I think a lot of people have a bandsaw, they know where the switch is and it cuts things until they bring the fence into play and start trying to do some resawing and then things get a little hairy from there. And that's what I'm going to really focus on today to try to get that straightened up. Because it has everything to do with setting up your bandsaw and setting up your fence. So for starters, uh, we're just going to talk in general about different parts of the bandsaw that are common to all bandsaws essentially. And, and that would be, you know, number one, the blade, number two, the wheel assembly, number three, the motor, number four, the guide systems. So in the, as far as the blades are concerned, I've got some handouts that we'll be handing out to you here in a little bit. Uh, to go into a little bit more detail, it's kind of hard to stuff all this information into 25 minutes, but the, the basic crux of, of blade technology is um, basically tooth per inch. Uh, there's a couple of different tooth styles, whether they have a rake. In other words, if the front of the tooth is at 90 degrees to the body of the blade, that would be a zero rake, kind of just like on table saw blades. Uh, a positive rake would be as if it had a, a definite hook to it. Um, and that would be a more aggressive blade. Uh, would give you a slightly rougher cut, but it would also clean the debris out of the cut faster so that you could cut faster and thicker and more dense wood. Going to the other side, finer teeth with less rake are going to cut slower, but they're going to cut smoother. Uh, they're not going to really like doing thick wood too much. They're not going to have enough uh, tooth to get the debris out of the way, so they tend to get hot. And of course, heat's you know the mortal enemy of any good blade. Um, so, in general, the blade is meant to fit the type of work that you want to do with it. If you want to do tight, scrolly work, you're going to want a very thin blade, maybe one like this. Um, and they would size this in the dimension of, of what it is between the back of the blade and the front of the tooth. So in this case, this is a 3 16 inch blade and that's what they're referring to as the overall depth from the front of the tooth to the back of the blade. And then you'll see TPI and that's how many teeth per inch the blade has. And the higher the number, uh, the smoother and slower cut you're going to get. And, and you know the reverse is also true. The lower the number, the more aggressive cut, the faster cut, but it'll be a rougher cut, the, the edge that's left behind. Um, also on here is the length, which has to obviously be matched to your bandsaw. And then the thickness, and that's the width of the blade itself. And that's much more important on the larger blades when you're trying to do resawing of thick dense materials a thicker blade can help you uh, avoid the cupping that sometimes happens when trying to do that that and proper tension so again I've got a handout that I'll give you that goes into a little bit more detail about exact rake angles and things like that but that's the general crux of that um, next would be the wheel size Every bandsaw has got wheels on it. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's how it turns the blade or moves the blade. There's some older ones that are three wheel. I haven't seen much three wheels around anymore. Um, I think it puts a little bit too much pressure on the blade itself having to flex around those three points. There was an advantage to them because they give you extra depth for a relatively small machine. Uh, and when I say depth, I mean, you know, how wide a board you could fit between the carriage or between the blade and, and the back of the carriage here. But again, you don't see many of those. Most bandsaws now are all the two wheel system like this. And their size will be the same as the uh, dimension of the wheel here. So in, in this case, this wheel is 14 inches across. This is a 14 inch bandsaw, probably the most common size you're ever going to find. 
and in fact that is the throat depth of here. You got a little guard here, you might end up with 13 and 3 quarters or something of actual depth, but in general it's a 14 inch machine and so obviously if it had a 20 inch wheel, it'd be a 20 inch machine. And then of course the bigger you get, you have the capability of running wider blades. This one will run up to a 1 inch blade, uh, so the 18 inch Rikon over there can run up to an inch and a half I believe. Uh, so you would want that for doing more aggressive, thicker, more dense wood resawing, stuff like that. So again, the wheel size is pretty much equal to the size of the bandsaw, usually the model number. Um, the motor on a bandsaw, you know, you have to kind of take with a grain of salt. Um, they might say one horsepower on the motor. There really isn't anybody watching all these manufacturers and making sure they're accurate with their horsepower claims. There's some figures that I could give you to help you figure out what the true horsepower is. It has to do with the amount of amperage it's drawing and at what voltage. That really is how it boils out. All, all of you, I'm sure, probably have a shop vac in your, in your shop, and it's probably a, a five or six horsepower shop vac, which, which really isn't possible out of a 110 outlet. It, it, you know, it's possible, but it's not likely. So there's other criteria that manufacturers are allowed to use to claim these horsepower. If you really have it boiled down to two different machines and everything is equal except for the horsepower rating, take a look at the amperage draw on the motor. That's going to tell you what true power that motor has. So the, the more amperage draw, the, the stronger the motor will be. It's pretty simple. Um, and, I, and I would hope it's obvious why you would want a stronger motor. Obviously the bigger bandsaw wheel, bigger bandsaw, bigger capacity, it's going to need a bigger motor. Um, so that leaves us down to the guide systems, which, which I think causes the most grief or gives the most pleasure as far as using the bandsaw if it's worked right, if it's set up right. Um, guide systems come, you know, number one, there's two basic systems that are used to guide the bandsaw blade. And when I mean guide, you know, as, as you're making a cut and you make a turn, the bandsaw blade would naturally want to twist. And so we need something to stop that from happening. And, and then also keep it from wandering when we're doing even a straight cut. So these roller bearings you see on this Powermatic unit are there to keep the blade from you know, deflecting too much in a turn or in a, in a resaw situation. And again, there's two basic styles of blade guides. There is the kind of a plastic, although it has a, I believe it's a graphite impregnation into the plastic. Uh, obviously it's a patented, uh, you know, method of making them, but essentially these cool blocks by, uh, by Olsen, they're designed to be in full contact with the blade itself or maybe just uh, maybe four thousandths off the blade, maybe the thickness of a dollar bill. Some people like to run them right up against the blade. Obviously you're going to have some heat issues if you go too long like that, but it gives you very superior guiding. Uh, it's not going to let the blade twist at all. Um, and, but they are a wear item. You got to constantly kind of keep an eye on them. I know from my personal experience uh, in running a thin blade kind of like this one, uh, or, or you know, narrow blade, the blocks on mine are, oh, they're roughly 3 eighths by 3 eighths, I'd say. So they were wider than the blade. So I kept trying to adjust them because they were letting the blade twist too much and I couldn't figure out why they wouldn't tighten against the blade. Well, they were touching each other behind the blade. So keep an eye out for that. Sometimes you might have to take them out and dress them on a, on a wheel or something, maybe a file, get them you know, flat again. On the wider blades, obviously that's not such a problem. One thing I like about the cool block system, if you run it, you know, right against the blade or real close to the blade, it kind of helps to clean the blade. You know, if you've got some pitch going on and it's sticking to the blade, that pitch can get deposited on the tires here and cause a little thump, thump, thump in your bandsaw. So I believe anyway that a cool block type of situation kind of helps scrape that off as it goes around. Um, the, the other type is ball bearing style like this and since we're kind of talking about that pitch deal, sometimes the ball bearings can actually press that onto the blade and almost solidify that little hump, hump, hump. You got to stop the, the bandsaw and get a card out or something and, and scrape that off the blade. But having said that, these can run in full contact and not get hot and they don't wear 
you know, by the by the removal of stock of themselves, they they would wear you know the ball bearing in a natural way like that, uh, and they do seize up. But uh, they give you, I believe, a little bit better tracking uh, because they can be in full contact with the blade. And they can also cause some other issues, though, is that if you have them out of adjustment and they're forcing the blade over to the side, they will do that easier than a cool block would because they're rolling it by. So you got to really watch your setup on them. Um, you know, they're available if your bandsaw has the cool block system, let's say. Uh, again, like, um, where'd I put those? Like these. You can, if you're just unhappy with those, you can actually switch over to that full roller bearing system with a Carter upgrade kit like this. The price varies 150, 250, depending on your machine, but you get everything that you need, the top assembly, the bottom assembly, the rod, everything that you would need to switch over to the roller bearing. Um, so that's available. Another kind of a hybrid of both of them that's available that I don't have an example of at the moment, but it's a band roller is what it's called. I think that's the name of the manufacturer. Anyway, it's, it's a approximately 3 8 by 3 8 steel block with a roller bearing at the end of it. You know, the arms come out and there's a very small roller bearing. So you can put them in your standard cool block assembly guide system and have roller bearing, uh, you know, guide capability. So that's kind of worth looking into as well. Um, so that covers the basic styles of the guides. Does anybody have any questions so far?